Um, <clears throat> today I wanted to talk about what I like to dub as the soft mind, but I mentioned that to a couple of people and they said, oh, that's got a really negative connotation like being soft in the head, which I don't know, I don't mind that either personally, but that's not what it means. So I changed the name to A Mind Like Molten Gold. And uh, there's a good reason for that, because there are several places in the suttas where the Buddha actually talks about the mind as being likened to that gold that's been purified, that's been melted, smelted um, down, and then settled. Um, and basically, once it's been settled, you can use it. You can use it in whatever way you want to use it. So whether that's for deepening your samadhi and going into the deep states of jhanas, or whether that's for the purpose of looking at your past lives. If you want to bring up a past life, it can be possible when the mind is really deeply purified and very powerful. Or it could be looking at the characteristics of impermanence, suffering and non-self. So the Buddha says in the Anguttara Nikaya, and I don't know if I have any sutta uh, enthusiast here, but it's the Anguttara 1, 47, that there's nothing more soft and pliant than a mind which is properly developed and cultivated. So a soft mind is the outcome of practicing correctly. And of course, being together here in the Dhamma Hall at Gaia House, I'm sure that many of you have practiced with various teachers, and sometimes we can get a little bit uh, technique-centric, so it's all about what we're doing, or you know whether we're working with the breath, or the body sensations, or the Mahasi method, or um, open awareness. But I always like to uh, orient the teachings towards um, more of the quality of our minds. What is the quality of that mind that's aware? What is the sort of attitude that we bring to our practice? How do we relate to whatever's arising right now? Because the Buddha said that the mind matters most. And if we speak or act from a pure mind, then happiness follows us like a shadow. It's that mind, the mental qualities that we cultivate that really determine whether we uh, move towards freedom and peace or we create suffering for ourselves and others in the world. So that's one of the yardsticks to measure your practice. Are you actually moving from suffering to happiness um, and other people around you benefiting also from your practice? Or are you becoming more contracted, tense, tight, even brittle, you know? Don't disturb my practice. That's a, a hard, a brittle mind. So a soft mind is actually not a weak mind. It's a very resilient mind. And it takes courage to be soft. It takes courage to be open and receptive, right? So a soft mind is like a rubber ball, you can imagine. Like you can sort of throw it down to the floor and it just bounces off, right? It's very resilient. It's, uh, it's malleable, pliant. It's not going to break. It's not going to crack. Or it could be seen as like bread, dough, you know, when you want to bake bread, you, you need the dough. And after a while, even if you pinch it and squeeze it and even punch it, it just comes back up again into the same shape. That's like a soft mind, a mind that doesn't fracture or fragment, a mind that doesn't retaliate, you know, with harsh words or maybe with resentment that become more and more ingrained <coughs> and harden our mind. A hard mind, of course, is more like a glass. It might look more resilient, it's hard, you can't sort of change it by squeezing it or squashing it, but if you drop it on the floor, it just shatters into many, many pieces. And so it's actually no use anymore, right? And that's like the kind of mind which has um, a very rigid sense of self, you know? Ajahn Brahm has a nice simile, my, that's my teacher. He's um, a forest monk in Australia, originally from England. Um, and he said it's like, people have what, what you can call invisible spikes. There are some people you can get really, really close to them. And no matter how close you get, even when you try to irritate them or agitate them, they just respond kindly, softly, with patience, with forgiveness. You know, they, they hardly ever get sort of um, reactive or, or say anything mean to you back. And that's like a person with um, hardly any spikes. But then there are these other people who are like, come across as very pleasant, very kind when things are going their way. But if you get too close to them, suddenly the spikes come out. Maybe just little spikes, but you've got too close and those defences come out and they can hurt you. They can poke you or prick you, even make you bleed. 
And then there are even other people with very sharp spikes, you know, people that, the kind of people who, when they walk into the room, the whole sort of atmosphere bristles. You can feel that this person's very tense. You don't want to offend or upset them because the spikes will come out almost immediately and just start projecting and, and you know, hurting anybody who's around. So the soft mind is very kind, forgiving, flexible, patient. It can adjust. It can multitask, it can adapt to different circumstances the way that water adapts to whatever shape vessel that you pour that water in, right? But a soft mind can also be firm. You can also advocate for your own needs. It's not that you become a pushover. You have your boundaries. But at the same time, you can listen and empathise fairly readily with other people too. You can take on other perspectives and maybe even adapt and adjust your own worldview to incorporate the way that other people look at things. So you can see how this is um, the opposite of grasping, the opposite of aversion. It's actually a flexibility that's close to letting go. You can even define insight meditation as um, ways of regarding experience that soften craving, that soften release, let go of grasping, of craving. Yeah. And we do that by abandoning that very same craving. And the Buddha said in the Third Noble Truth that um, that abandonment of craving happens through giving, being generous, giving things away, giving up our clinging to our sense of self. It happens through, um, that's called chaga in Pali, through relinquishment, patinisaga. Yeah, we relinquish our craving, our grasping, our sense of being right. <laughs> because we always think we're right. We wouldn't have a thought that we felt that we knew was incorrect, right? Whatever we think, whatever sort of uh, hypothesis we come up with, we ov obviously think that it's right. So we relinquish that sort of um, dogmatic sense of feeling that we always get it right. And then freeing is the third type of letting go. That's mutti in Pali. So it's the freedom to actually be content with little, rather than freedom to have everything go our way, right? Because the freedom that we speak about in the West is actually not really freedom at all. It's the freedom to get, the freedom to obtain. You know, America is the great free society. We can have whatever we want. You just have to put your mind to it and work hard and everything you ever wanted you will, you will uh, achieve. But that isn't real happiness at all. Because the craving is still there. And when you get what you wanted, the whole thing becomes kind of unfulfilling again because that mind is always seeking something new. It's still thirsty. It's still grasping. It's still not content. And then the last kind of letting go is what the Buddha calls the uh, mind, which is analio, which means um, it's like having a non-stick mind. It, analia literally means no resting place. Like alia is like Himalaya. So Himalaya means the abode of snow. And alia means like an abode, so analia means having no abode, no resting place, nowhere for these defilements to stick, yeah? nowhere for the insults to stick. Somebody can say harsh words to you, they can criticise you, or they can praise you. And, you know, it might impact you a little bit, but it doesn't stay too long. You're like that soft rubber ball, things can just bounce off. Yeah? So this is what happens when the mind is soft. And soft people are endowed with a sense of faith and confidence. Um, they're humble, gentle and welcoming. They're able to receive experience. And as a result of that, the Buddha says that they're capable of receiving the teachings as the Noble Ones teach. As the Noble Ones teach, they understand it. In other words, there's the way whatever's taught goes in the way it's meant to because we don't have such a strong sense of self kind of arguing back or interfering with what's being said. We're able to receive things. And I think the other reason that um, people with a soft mind can understand things the way they're meant to be understood is because by softening our mind, by purifying the gold in these lovely similes in the suttas, we're actually purifying the gold of its impurities like lead, copper, tin, dirt, sand. And that's a simile for the five hindrances. We purify our mind of the five hindrances, the craving, the aversion, restlessness, 
um, doubt and uh, sleepiness, drowsiness, yeah? often called sloth and torpor. And those hindrances are that which distort perception. Whenever we have craving or anger in our mind, we're not seeing things the way we are. We're seeing them the way we want to see them, or we're not seeing them the way we don't want to see them. We don't want to see that things are non-self. We don't want to see that there's no real permanent happiness to be found in this body and mind. Right? We don't really want to see that. And so the mind becomes repelled from those truths. Whereas when the mind is soft, it's able to receive and to say, let me just absorb that and see where it leads. So the mind that's soft is almost like a sponge, you know, it can absorb water. But it's very soft, it can also release that water as well. The body can also become very soft through the process of meditation. You can imagine your body like a sponge, full of little holes, you know. It's porous, and we can just relax our body and let those tensions seep out, just like water seeps out of a sponge. And another beautiful thing about um, a mind that is soft, malleable, wieldy, in the Buddha's words, is that the view is also malleable. Our views of the world, you know, are not fixed. There's a very interesting um, experiment done. I'm not sure when this was done, but it showed that the way we relate to the past also changes depending on our current world view. So we have this memory of the past that is really um, unreliable, most of the time when we remember the past, we're remembering our last memory of it. So it actually starts to become less and less reliable the longer time proceeds. Um, and we even kind of make up memories that just align more clearly with who we think we are or with our current view. So there was a study done and um, 100 people made a decision about end-of-life care. So they were asked to record their decision, you know, what would you do at the end of life? What would you like to happen? <clears throat> and then one year later, um, they asked the same people again, and 25% of the people changed their answers. They changed their mind in that last one year. But the really interesting thing about that is that 75% of the people who changed their mind insisted they hadn't. They were absolutely sure that they'd made the same decision a year before. Because the mind dislikes any kind of dissonance. And it actually changes the memory to accord with our current world view. It's really interesting, isn't it? And I think, you know, the implication of this is that we stop believing so deeply, so strongly in our version of events. And not only our version of events in the past, but even our version of what's happening right now. You know, are you so sure that the person in front of you really meant what they said the way you think they did? One of the most precious teachings I've received from, I think, even my first teacher, Goenka, and also Ajahn Brown, is to never ascribe intentions to another person, because we simply don't know where they're coming from, right? So it's always a mistake to assume we know, because again, our view of people gets fixed, especially if uh, something they did or said kind of uh, engendered a very strong reaction from us or um, kind of touched a nerve. Yeah, if we have a hard, brittle mind, then the sense of self is so com solid, so compact. You know, we really react um, by being very offended when, when things don't go our way or people don't behave the way we want them to. And so, you know, perhaps you've had a friend who you've got on really well with all your life or maybe a partner who you've been with for many, many years. But then you start to see a certain type of behaviour or attitude or quality sort of that you don't like very much start to develop. You might look at that person's behaviour then 20 years ago and start imposing that quality on them then as well. <laughs> Even though you never noticed it before, you just start to think, oh, so when they did that in the past, they must have been really angry too, you know. <laughs> because we really like everything to accord with our view. And actually, people are just processors. We're changing all the time, you know. How can we fix another if we can't even fix ourselves? I remember just a few years ago, someone tried to ask me about myself, or maybe not even ask me, but they were trying to figure me out. I could feel they were trying to put me in a box. It's like, oh, so you're like this. I'm, you know, now I'm getting to know you're like this, you're like this. And I was like, I'm not really quite comfortable with that because I can be like that. I, for, for example, I can be sociable, I can be outgoing, 
but I can also really enjoy my solitude and sometimes I just want to be alone, you know. So it never really works to put people into these categories and I think it can be very uncomfortable for ourselves as well. The other interesting thing about a soft mind is that it's a happy mind. And as I said, the whole purpose of this path is to move out of suffering and towards deeper and deeper happiness and the kind of happiness that wells up from within. Yeah, not the kind of happiness that's really dependent on our um, sensual pleasures, on you know pleasant sights, sounds, taste, touch or smell, but the kind of happiness that is um, coming from a sense of inner integrity, a sense that we're living a good life, we're living aligned to our values, um, and a sense of uh, maybe groundedness within ourselves. Yeah? Often people say they feel happy when their mind is settled or when they're feeling like a quiet sense of joy because it's not an agitating sort of happiness. It's the kind of happiness that can actually lead to the still peaceful states of samadhi, the sometimes called the concentrated mind. I actually think it's almost the opposite of concentrated because concentrated implies putting something very large into a very small space, like concentrated washing up liquid or concentrated laundry liquid. It's like everything's in a small space. Whereas to me, the mind of samadhi is a mind that's quite expansive, quite vast, and, and it's almost as though it includes everything, but then, once it's included things, then it settles down. So it's not so much a mind that rejects, but a mind that includes and embraces and then gradually stills. Just like in this simile of the gold, we melt it down, we remove the impurities, and gradually, gradually, it starts to settle, it starts to still. And then you can use that gold, the Buddha says, um, to make anything you want to. There's another lovely sutta that says it's like a, a goldsmith. They melt it down, they also blow on that gold to keep it the right temperature, and they sprinkle it with water as well um, to make sure it doesn't get too hot. And then from time to time they just leave it alone to settle. And it's the same thing with our mind. We can't always be putting effort in, you know, blowing, blowing, blowing on our mind. Sometimes we need to actually sprinkle some water. You know, and other times we need to just quietly look on with equanimity. So we have to learn how to work with our mind in, in skillful ways. But generally the happy mind, the mind that's becoming um, tranquil, you know, first the body becomes tranquil, then the mind starts to become tranquil. And then it starts to experience happiness and contentment. And it's the happy, contented mind that attains samadhi states. Sukhi no chitam samadhi yati, straight from the suttas. Happiness is the proximate cause for samadhi. And happiness is also, of course, a result of that very same samadhi. A mind that has been deeply rested in the deep states of jhana or absorption is an incredibly buoyant, light, happy, malleable mind. Yeah? As I said, it can, you can direct it towards anything you want to see, whether that's impermanence or non-self. It's stable, it's steady, but it's also wieldy and malleable. You can turn it into whatever you want to. And uh, it's really interesting being around people that practice in, in very deep states of samadhi frequently because when they come out of those deep states of meditation, you can ask them anything, you know, and they'll say yes. <laughs> My own teacher, Ajahn Brahm, always says that as a sort of little hint, you know. You ask me something when I've just come out of my cave. He has a cave that he lives in. He says, you know that I'll say yes, or if I've been doing some chanting, you know. And for him, the chanting very much means a lot. A lot of these chants that we do in monasteries are the Buddha's own words. And once you understand that Pali, they're very beautiful teachings, you know. So sometimes you can be chanting the metta, and the metta starts to really arise and develop in the mind. To the point where I think my teacher once said he couldn't actually continue with the chant because he was just getting so blissed out, you know. So you talk to people after these kind of states, when the hindrances have been fully abandoned for that state of... Um, for that period of time and it's impossible to make them irritated or to get any kind of <laughs> sort of strong reaction from them they're just very amenable very um, easygoing you know just very lovely to be around and no judgment no sort of um, demand that they make on you to be anything other than the way you are it's a really beautiful uh, safe space to be so I wanted to talk a bit about, of course, how to soften our mind. 
how to remove those impurities and melt the gold. And to first of all say that it's not about trying harder. Right? The whole talk is about softness. So trying harder makes the mind harder. <laughs> so instead of using force and you know will, we actually learn to just settle the mind by restraint, by restraining the um, unwholesome states of mind, and by cultivation. So part of restraint, of course, is virtue, and also part of cultivation is living a virtuous ethical life. And I know that most people here probably know very well what the five precepts are and the general kind of way that the Buddha talks about virtue. But I wanted to talk about like what's really behind virtue because the motivation for our virtue should always be compassion. It's coming from a sense of um, compassion and non-harm. Yeah? And it's also an act of generosity because by um, purifying our body and speech, the way we relate to other people, we're actually giving others a sense of trust, a sense of safety, right? And our virtuous conduct as it improves and increases into beautiful acts, not only restraint but actually actions, like for example speaking words that uplift the heart, or praising others, trying to encourage others, that really enriches our own life, our own mental qualities, and it enriches the lives of those around us as well. Virtue also leans in the direction of contentment and simplicity. Because as that happiness starts to well up from inside, we don't need so much in the external world. Yeah? We don't need to rely on things going our way or having big houses. or you know, We're very, very happy and contented with little. So that, of course, declutters our life, but it also declutters our mind. And then uh, another aspect of virtue, which I think is really beautiful, is that it includes empathy. It includes trying to look at things from other people's perspective. So in the suttas, and I forget exactly which one, but there's this lovely passage that um, reflects on one's conduct, and it says something like, um, just as I don't like being spoken to with harsh words, um, others don't like being spoken to with harsh words, therefore I will refrain from using harsh words. But it doesn't stop there, it actually says I will um, encourage others to refrain from using hard words. And I will um, praise the use of gentle speech, kind speech, you know, harmonious speech that delights in concord, that brings people together. So we first think of it from the perspective of others and then accordingly we adapt our own behaviour and think about how we can actually be proactive in um, developing beautiful qualities within our heart. And then another way is um, sense restraint, which is just like an extension of virtue of body and speech. This is more like virtue of the mind, virtue the, at the mental level. So we learn, for example, to give people the benefit of the doubt, to see the best in others. As I said, not to ascribe intentions to others, but to actually question, you know, ask them, well, why did you do that? You know, that it had this effect on me. I'm wondering where you were coming from, you know, what was going on for you at that time? And we start to look at others, look at our experience, even look at ourselves in ways that lead to the wholesome qualities increasing within our mind. Yeah? This is like the number one rule, really, the yardstick to measure um, whether you're really practicing the Dhamma. Are you thinking, perceiving, using your attention, your body and speech in ways that lead to the wholesome states increasing and the unwholesome states decreasing? Or is the way you're looking at things, regarding things, others, you know, views, politics, whatever it is, are you looking at things in a way that's actually increasing unwholesome states? Because if you are, that's only leading to suffering. It's not a moral judgment, but we're, our interest is to understand suffering and to start coming out of suffering, right? And you don't have to be suffering like with intense anxiety or deep depression. Any kind of contracted state, any kind of you know weariness, tiredness, uh, melancholy, is there something we can do? Is there some way we can use our mind to counterbalance that? So sometimes you know we might read a lot of the news, and to a certain point, it's beneficial because a sense of genuine care and compassion might arise. But after a while, that compassion can turn into empathetic distress. And we can start to feel really heavy and as though we're carrying the suffering and the sadness of the world on our shoulders. And at that time, again, using the soft, flexible mind, we can learn to 
change our perception to pick out, to intentionally pick out the beauty, the goodness in the world. Looking at the world through the eyes of mudita, recognizing the good, recognizing the kindness, the beauty, the goodness in the world. There's so much of that. In fact, I would say so very much more. So we do this and we develop this lovely, um, pure mental conduct. And then when we sit down to meditate, the first thing that I always try to do is develop a generous attitude towards my meditation. So I'm not meditating for myself, but I'm meditating for others. I'm meditating to develop my mind in, in ways that will contribute to the happiness, to the kindness, to the goodness in this world. And that will help to overcome delusion in myself, which will then again help others. So I'm not meditating to get something for myself. I'm meditating to give, to give away. It's an act of generosity. And if you are, you know, a devotional sort of person or you have a lot of confidence in maybe the Buddha or a teacher or a wise person that personifies compassion or wisdom to you, you can meditate for them. You can meditate as an act of devotion toward them, you know, out of respect for what you've learned, out of gratitude. You can meditate, you know, through inspiration. You want to develop some of those same qualities in yourself. And then we establish our mindfulness, but in this uh, context of a soft mind, we establish a mindfulness which is very wide and expansive and soft. So we don't get too close to our object. We keep our awareness almost like cotton wool. And I'll guide you in a meditation using some of these images and see if anything works for you. It's also like, uh, I was thinking about it this morning, like you have an attitude which is like a mother with wide open arms, you know, ready to embrace her child. And whether that child is like clean or grubby, whether they've like had a, had a shower or a wash or whether they've been playing on the playground or sticking their nails into the dirt, the mother opens her arms to them in the same way. Whether that child is happy and bubbly, you know, full of fun, or whether that child is irritable, angry, exhausted, the mother's open-armed embrace is the same to both, right? She has the same open-hearted concern and compassion to both children. So in a similar way, we establish a mindfulness which is like a mother's open arms. Whatever little children come into our mind, you know, the ones that are arguing, I don't want to sit, I don't feel good, I've got a headache, or, you know, we meet them with that open-armed embrace with that unconditional loving-kindness that's not here to change or fix uh, whatever we experience, but it's just there to understand, to learn and to care. And then when we have this very um, soft, receptive mind, you'll notice that the breath may sometimes just arise on its own because the breath is a very subtle object and if you want to you know, use the breath meditation, which is the Buddha's own preferred method, and I think many of us are working with, um, you do need a very subtle and receptive mind. You know, the breath is not going to sink into a mind which is like a stone, a concrete mind, you know. It just can't absorb into it. The mind is still too hard. So if that's the case, you know, we can go back and just develop um, our attitude to the practice. We can just work on having more metta, more softness in our mind, first of all. And then when the mind is soft enough, the breath will just come in and you'll receive that breath. It's like your mind will soak it up like a sponge. And the breath becomes a place where you can rest your mind. It'll just carry you into these states of calm. It's a very calming rhythm to be with the breath. So not grabbing the breath and saying, come on, I want you to stay with me, you know. That's like going out and grabbing your friend and saying, come on, sit down with me, stay you know, and the friend's dying to go to the loo or they want to go home and be with their family and you just grab their arm and say, no, you stay with me. You know, that friend isn't going to like you very much. They're going to want to run away at the first possible chance and they're not going to come back for a very long time. The breath is just the same. <laughs> if the first minute you see that breath, you just go and grab it and make it stay with you, it's not going to like you very much. It's not going to trust you. So instead of that, you know, you ask it, do you want to come in? It's okay if you want to come in, you know, you can stay as long as you want. If you want to leave, that's fine. But I could keep on softening my mind, keep on preparing the field, tilling the soil in my mind so that it's ready to receive that breath. 
And also, lastly, before we do some meditation, it's also about adjusting our attention, right? Having a soft mind, having a flexible mind means being able to adjust our meditation, um, depending on the state of mind that we encounter from time to time. So it might mean adjusting our focus from being very, very close into the present moment or close with the sensations in the body or the breath or to having a more wider focus, like a camera where you zoom out a bit, you know, and you have a, a wider lens. So we can adjust our focus. We can also adjust the distance from our object. It's similar. It's a very similar thing, right? Generally speaking, when you're working with, like, body awareness in a sort of more um, broader kind of way, our attention is quite close, but not very, very close. Also in daily life, when we're working with sense restraint, the object and ourself, there's a bit of distance there. But as the mind starts to settle and, and sort of still, then that object gets closer and closer to our mind, so the mind starts to absorb really, really close into the breath. It's like the object's becoming so close that eventually absorption actually happens. They become unified. So we can play with that a little bit or just notice what is your distance from the object. And then lastly, again, the quality of our attention. We might find we need a little bit more metta, or maybe a little bit less metta, in the sense that once the metta is flowing, once the loving kindness is there, it's established in an attitude, you don't have to try hard to maintain it. You can just use the equanimity and just start looking on. Just let go a little bit more, relax into the process. And if you start to become lazy or sleepy, again, Using the simile of the goldsmith, you can blow on that gold, blow on the fire, um, by again rousing some energy. Yeah? So we adjust, we learn to be very skillful in how we work with our mind, work with our mind and not against it. So the mind really does become a very beautiful friend. And as the Buddha said once again, nothing is more soft and pliant than a mind which is properly developed and cultivated. The mind becomes our friend, able to do whatever we want with that mind, able to direct it to any area of experience we want to have a little bit um, of a closer look at. Yeah? And so the mind becomes yeah, our greatest strength. And happiness follows us wherever we go. So that's enough from me. And let's do some meditation, shall we? So because we're talking about being soft and gentle, <laughs> please do carry that same attitude into the way you sit. Ask your body if you need to stretch it a little bit, first of all. If you have a glass of water close by, you might want to take a sip. Unfortunately, my water is a long way from where I am. <laughs> so I'll be gentle with my thirst. So see how your body is most comfortable, most at ease. And treating your body like a friend rather than a slave. Not forcing it to sit in the meditation posture you see in magazines. <laughs> but even lying down, very good. Or taking a pillow in your back or Maybe sitting on a chair. And just gently closing your eyes if you're comfortable to do that. With your eyes closed, you may find that you start contacting feelings in your body. Initially, becoming more aware of the posture that you've chosen. And taking time to make little adjustments. To give your body as much comfort as you possibly can. You might find your ankle is pressed into your shin and you think, never mind, it's just a short meditation. 
But no, see if you can actually give it a little bit more space. Because this establishes a really trusting, beautiful relationship with your own body. A relationship where your body is your friend and not your slave. Checking whether your back is comfortable. You might want to put a little more height underneath your buttocks at the back. Is the weight evenly distributed? Are your shoulders a little bit tense? Imagining your body like a very porous sponge. from which any tension, any tightness, contraction can gently flow out. As though your body were full of holes and establishing an attitude of generosity. This meditation is a gift to yourself and also to others. An opportunity just to relax. To take some breathing space. to understand and to care for your mind. For this short period, I'm not going to push you around anymore, mind. I'm not going to make any demands or judge you. but just like a mother with open arms. I'm going to welcome and embrace whatever arises in this body and mind. And with this lovely, generous, caring attitude, we establish a mindfulness that is wide and expansive. A touch that is soft.
and starting if you wish from the top of the head we're just going to allow that soft awareness like the touch of cotton wool to spread through the whole body noticing any sensations with a very gentle, soft, receptive mind moving through the whole head to the brow imagining the brow area expanding the space between the eyebrows opening up the brain resting on a soft mattress tucking up the brain as though you're putting it to sleep for a short little nap the jaw the neck maybe noticing the air as it enters through the nostrils Noticing the touch of that air, perhaps on your palate or in your throat. Moving down through the shoulders, the arms. Imagining those shoulders like a sponge that's been twisted. Now gently opening up. Any tension just seeping out of the holes in that sponge. your shoulders relax. Picking up any pleasant sensations in your arms and hands. with this same light, cotton wool-like touch spreading your awareness through the whole torso perhaps noticing the way the breath moves through the chest 
gently expanding the rib cage, the belly, and then relaxing. That gentle rhythm, allowing the mind to relax. So every pore we're breathing in, every pore of your body breathing out. Giving a little more attention to any areas where there are blockages or aches, tightness, contraction. Checking whether a very gentle attention is more helpful or whether you feel you want to examine, focus in on that area without force, but with curiosity. Using the breath to help you, if you wish. Experiencing the weight, maybe pressure in your buttocks, any feelings, any sensations in that area. Just receiving without holding on or pushing them away. And this soft awareness flows through your thighs. around every surface, the back of your knees, leaving no area untouched, perhaps moving deep inside through the muscles, the ligaments, the bones, deep inside your knees, Just caring for any sensation you experience. Softening into the experience. With a mind like a sponge. starting to notice subtler sensations 
like tingling, pleasure, warmth. Moving down through the whole lower leg into your feet, the heels, the soles, the upper part of the foot and into each and every toe. Noticing feelings, textures, maybe temperature. Just receiving with a soft, receptive mind. It helps, again, connecting to the rhythm of your breath. And expanding your mind to experience the whole body. Sitting, breathing, with every out breath becoming just a little bit more relaxed. Soak in to the mind, or if it bounces off, that's okay too. Just staying in this moment with patience, with forgiveness. Accepting your mind just as it is. And if you find your mind is starting to contract, close in or become a little bit brittle, gently widening your awareness. To include 
include a little bit more in the field of your perception. Maybe moving into the extremities, to the fingers and the toes. Noticing the rise and fall of the abdomen, of the chest. Relaxing all effort and just allowing yourself to enjoy, to pick up on any delight in this present moment, however subtle, however quiet that joy might be. going to ring the bell, just listening to the sound of that bell, noticing the vibration of each ringing of the bell in your body and mind. And just thanking yourself for your practice before you open your eyes.